Hey, welcome everyone. Hope you're having a great day today. My name is Bob Roberts and I'm an aerospace education officer with the Civil Air Patrol here in Greenville, South Carolina. Now our guest tonight is a passionate general aviation pilot who has been working to help promote aviation through engaging content and inspiring regular individuals who may not want to be a military or a commercial pilot. They want to get involved in general aviation community and our guest provides a great way for them to do so. He runs the Airplane Academy channel, which I will place a link to down below. I also personally hope to share a $100 burger with him today because he just seems kind of like a really kind of cool guy. And with that, let's welcome our guest today. His name is Charlie uh, Gassmeyer. Hey, Charlie, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm great, Bob. Thanks so much for having me. Well, thank you for joining us. Now, Charlie, just to get us started off, um, your focus has been really general aviation. What about general aviation makes you so excited that you put this much effort into promoting it? You know, it's funny. I'm obviously, you know, as you said in your intro, I'm not a military pilot, never going to fly a 737. I'm just a really average dude. Uh, but for me, even in that kind of mediocrity, uh, flying a Cessna 182 or a Super Cub or something, um, man, just makes me come alive. And I, I, I just, I can't, it's not for everybody, but for me personally, um, flying is just the most unique kind of life-giving thing I think you can go do to, 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 you know, go be with the birds and, uh, you know, live in a generation where we get to go experience that when people hundreds of years ago, you know, could only write poems about what it must be like to fly. And so I could go on and on and, and maybe we will throughout the, the course of this video, but, um, man, it's just always been a really romantic thing for me that I've always wanted to do since I can remember as a, as a, you know, young boy. You know, it's crazy to think when you look at the history of mankind, right? We've, you've only been able to fly for about a hundred years. And really, if you think about it, only in the last 60 or 70 years, uh, could people like you or me fly, you know, people that weren't flying in the military or, or doing something right. like that. Well, that's the crazy thing. And I, I think, uh, <laughs> when I hear people talking about being on a commercial flight and they say, man, that was a long flight. I was so bored. It almost, it almost makes me mad. Cause I'm thinking, you mean to tell me that, that we live in a time for the last hundred years to what you just said, that we're basically in a, in a controlled rocket going 40,000 feet in the air going, you know, five, 600 miles an hour. And you're bored with that. Um, gosh, I just, I can't relate to that at all. It's always been a, a really invigorating thing for me. Yeah. You're sitting in, you're sitting on a chair in a metal tube suspended 40,000 feet in the air, not falling to your death and traveling about 500 miles an hour. And you're bored. And you're bored. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I although I, I, was, I guess from the uh, safety of aviation standpoint, I guess that's a good thing, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, that's well, that, that is true. No news is good news when you're at uh, 40,000 feet. Now, you know, it's, um, it's outside of our conversation today, but just uh, because we time, started kind of talking about it, you know, what do you think about, um, you think in our lifetime, you think we'll be going from uh, airplanes to actual real rocket, you mentioned rockets, I mean, you know, with SpaceX and uh, you think we're going to be in rockets by the end of our lifetime? I, you know, I, I do. Um, in fact, it's funny you ask me that. So a couple months ago, I, I got to interview an astronaut on my channel over at Airplane Academy. And that was a, a lifelong dream for me to come true, just to sit down and get to ask an astronaut, you know, an hour's worth of every, you know, probably naive question I've ever, you know, just, hey, what's it like being weightless and stuff? So it, it's worth watching over on that channel. He was a four-time shuttle uh, astronaut, two as a pilot, two as a commander. And one of the things we closed with was talking about the future of space travel. And 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 he was saying, yeah, hey, you're going to be able to go to space if you want to in your lifetime. And And the other thing I'll say about that is he mentioned that, and you're not going to have to be in the Navy to, to go get on a rocket. He said that my advice to people, and this is what he closed with, he said, if you want to go to space one day, just go be really good at what you're passionate about. If that's being an engineer or a plumber or an artist or a musician, because as we you know, populate space, in his opinion, those functions um, are going to be necessary. And so just focus on what you love and there will be a role in space for you. So my role I want to do is I want to be the very first space rotor router. I want to be the guy <laughs> to unplug the toilets in, on the very first Mars space. That's what I want. Yeah, life. That's what he talked about on the video, actually. That was one of his <laughs> missions where he had to fix the toilet. Oh, I, really? I, I didn't even, I haven't heard it yet. So yeah, I, you should go watch it. It's funny. So I said, hey, there's no excuse for, you know, if the wife says your toilet's broken on, you know, if you can fix the one in the space shuttle, you can fix the one in the guest bathroom. So uh, <laughs> that excuse is out the window for him. You know, I actually had a question. I haven't watched the whole interview yet. I only got a chance to uh, look at a little bit of it. Um, but I'm going to jump ahead in some of the questions I had because I actually did have a question about that interview. Because um, mm -hmm. first of all, just um, on a personal side, I want to just let you know that the videography just looked awesome. Um, oh, thank you. 
So I was super impressed with the lighting. Now I know that's a little bit of, you know, um, um, behind baseball, you know, geeking out kind of thing for people like us. Um, but you know, and I want, and maybe after the, the interview is done, I'd like to ask you a little more about how you got that lighting to be so good. It just looked crystal clean. Um, Thank you. who was, who was the astronaut you talked to? His name is Tom Hendricks. He lives uh, here in Texas and, um, yeah, four, four time astronaut. He's, uh, he's one of a kind, really, really great guy. Now, when you were interviewing the astronaut, what was one of the takeaways that you want viewers of that video to, uh, to, to take away? Yeah. So I, I think one of the, one of the biggest reasons that I wanted to interview him in the first place. And, and, and part of the reason I was so nervous to do it was because all my life as I've been, you know, Apollo 13 is my favorite movie. And mm -hmm. as I've been watching the space program, the SpaceX stuff, and like astronauts are, are, I think they're heroes and they're certainly heroes of mine. And I've always just kind of elevated them to this pedestal. And I, I think, I think they deserve that, but I, I just wanted to be able to talk to one to say, Hey, as much of a hero as you are, what's it like to be weightless? Like I, mm -hmm. for some reason that juxtaposition, maybe it is of like, they're this incredibly accomplished person. And I have a really stupid question like that. That meeting of that uh, was something I, I really wanted to do. And I, I, I hope that it, I, I asked some questions that others, you know, are, are curious about too. And I hope that's what made the interview good. But all, all that to say, I think the biggest takeaway that I got from him was how approachable he is mm -hmm. and how normal and down to earth, pardon the astronaut pun, uh, you know, he is. And so it was this really cool moment for me. And I think hopefully for viewers too, to realize like as much as we might fantasize about space and want to go do that one day, the people and the heroes who have done that are, are, are normal people. I mean, they're obviously brilliant and they're accomplished, but like they're normal people. And so it made the concept of, you know, space travel or, or rocketry, it, it made it feel closer to home for me. Like it was something, you know, attainable, whether or not I'll ever go to space one day. And, and, and that gave me, um, I don't know, just a really great feeling leaving the video that I, I hope viewers get from it as well. So I, you know, one thing, um, since you brought up the, the weightlessness, I'm always looking for really cool ways of, you know, collaborating, uh, you know, with the, the community. You ever thought about doing a zero G flight? Uh, sure. When are we going? I'm down. Yeah, I, I got to start saving you, my how pennies. How you but... get on one of those? Do you just buy a ticket somewhere? Yeah, I think it's really that simple. I just think it's, I think it's crazy expensive. But, <laughs> but I, um, I, I think I've heard some somewhere along the, I don't know. If somebody's out there for zero G and if you want us to advertise your flight, let Charlie and I come on for free <laughs> or yes, reduce please. price. Let me bring a camera and I'll pay you whatever you want. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, yeah. So I think that would be a lot of fun. Now, you know, going back to, uh, we kind of jumped ahead to the end of our conversation. I'm going to come back to the beginning because a lot of your channel is devoted towards uh, general aviation. Um, you spend a lot of time that are really valuable to not just people that have been flying for a while, but a lot of it is really helpful for people that are students. So if somebody is listening to this and, and they, they're looking for more content out there on the, on the internet, um, you know, for student pilots, somebody's looking at it interesting, I really do recommend you go check out Charlie because he's got some really great stuff out there. So, um, so Charlie, with that, um, let's see, you know, if someone was starting to think about getting into general aviation, what would you say, what would be your recommendation for how, for somebody to get started? Yeah, well, I, I think, um, you know, we can talk about the practical side of it, but I, I think just the philosophical side of it, I think a lot of people count themselves out before they ever get started, either with the amount of information that they're going to have to go learn or, you know, researching the steps involved or the costs, like all those things are, are, are obviously things you're going to have to, you know, figure out. But I think because of that, people end up, you know, waiting another week or waiting another month. And that turns into a lifetime. And so it's interesting that I talk to a lot of people. I try to respond to, to every comment uh, on my channel, unless you're unreasonably rude. Uh, but but most of them I, I love to interact with. And I, I you'd be shocked by how many people I hear from um, that are, you know, 60, 70 years old that are saying, hey, I waited when I was 15 and I, and I never got the chance to start. And so here I am and your videos are helping me want to start. And that, that's really rewarding for me. So I think the first piece of advice I'd have is, hey, don't wait. I, you know, I started when I was 14. Mm -hmm. I flew a Piper Super Cub and and nearly ran us off the runway. The only reason I didn't was because we were headed straight to the left off the runway and we happened to fly before we hit the grass. Like that's the only reason mm -hmm. I didn't <laughs> take us off the <laughs> runway. And so I would just say it's never too early to start. I started when I was 14, sold it on my 16th birthday. Um, and so if you're in that you know age range, you, you can start too. Now, you know, it, it, that's funny. Um, you see, so, you know, so many people will look at uh, people that aren't pilots. And they'll look at a video, you know, of somebody having a bad day in an airplane and they'll just be like, how could that happen? And it's like, 
until you've gotten in that airplane, you don't realize how fast things like that can happen. But at the same time, people don't realize how actually really safe general aviation really is too. Um, they see all these videos all the time and they just think, you know, all these airplanes are falling out of the sky and these airplanes are super safe. Um, even some of those bad videos you watch, you know, you see the person walk out of it, you know, like, what did I just do? Um, but they're really safe airplanes. Yeah. And I, I frequently just tell people, Hey, the, the drive that I have to go through to get to the airport, which is a pretty short drive, but involves a, a few major freeways in the, in the DFW Metroplex, that drive is way scarier than whatever flight I'm about to go take with all the people texting and lane changes and speeding and, you know, who knows what. Uh, that part's scary. Once you get to the airport, uh, it gets a lot safer. Yeah, I, I say the same thing. I'm like, you, you, your most dangerous part of that flight is the ride to the airport. It's the exact same thing I say. Mm-hmm. 100%. Um, yeah, you know, you, at some point, yes, I'm sure there are crazy pilots out there, but the percentage of craziness is a, little, is a lot lower than you see on the roads. Um, especially well, it's the usually not going to, you know, impact you. But I, I think, I think you bring up a good point about the safety stuff. I think, you know, my grandfather was a pilot. Uh, he's no longer with us, but my, my dad's a pilot also. So I come from a, a line of pilots, and my dad always, uh, you know, kind of raised me to like, you know, go read the accident reports or mm-hmm. go read the columns when they're talking about, you know, w- what happened in a crash, and and not, you know, I I think I think people who are uninformed about it will just read the news headlines, and you got to remember the news is only going to be what gets eyeballs, what's right. sensational, right? And so um, it's a little bit skewed, the information. But if you can go read the accident reports and the safety reports and, and kind of diagnose what went wrong, you can learn so much from them. And the, the most common denominator that I've always seen in those things, and I think the statistics back it up, is pilot error. There are mm-hmm. things that if the, if, the, if the pilot just chose not to fly that day or that mission or certain decisions that were made in flight, and I've even talked a little bit on my channel about stupid stuff I've done in flight. I wish I didn't. Um, if you eliminate those, uh, you know, flying is a very, very safe thing. So it's usually mm-hmm. you're the one you have to worry about. Yeah. Especially if you're trying to like rush to get some place or you're making a bad decision, you know, JFK Jr. probably would still be here if, uh, he wasn't, uh, you know, such a rush to try to get someplace. Um, all right. So, you know, when people start flying, one of the areas that makes them so nervous is looking for a CFI, right? And instead of, you know, I think people like yourself and myself, people have been around this for a while, you know, we understand the CFI performs a service for us. Um, you know, we're not, when we hire a CFI, it's, we're not having a CFI interview us, you know, we're asking, you know, information for the CFI, they're providing a service to us. So, so what would be one of your recommendations, uh, for individuals that are looking for their first CFI? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, if you're if you're able to, um, you know, fly with several different people at first, I highly recommend it because when you're first starting off, you're not going to know, you know, what kind of instructor you're comfortable with. Some people really like instructors that are, you know, really quick and kind of hard on them and stuff. And and hey, you know, give me tough love. Others, uh, I'm probably one of these. Likes it a little bit. You know, I I, I want I don't know if gentle is the right word, but I want <laughs> encourage. I guess I want encouraging. Uh, yep. reprimands instead of just like, oh, what are you doing? Don't do that. Um, and so if you can fly with different people, you'll kind of learn what your style is. Um, and then because I, I think if you're going to end up flying with an instructor you're not comfortable with, it's really going to slow down your learning because instead of thinking about what it is you're trying to learn, and there's a lot, you're going to be worried about the guy in the seat next to you. And so uh, if you're going to a flight school, I think it's great to fly with a bunch of different people. They all have their little you know, tips and tricks and you kind of get a good blend of it. But then I think if you can end up kind of picking a, a small cohort of two to three people that those are your, those are your people, or maybe even just one. I, I like it to be more than one because you get different perspectives, but just find who you're comfortable with. And and when you're paying so much money to learn to fly, I think you bring up a really good point. I mean, they're working for you, you're hiring them. And so don't feel bad saying, Hey, I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to go with somebody else. I, I feel more comfortable in the cockpit, just a personality thing, not like a safety thing um, with somebody else. And if that hurts their feelings. And you know, it's something they need to learn from. So it's okay. Yeah, I remember I had um, one of the first CFIs I worked with. He was kind of one of the CFIs. And some of these folks are great, so I'm not digging this, this style of CFI. But um, he was definitely, you know, uh, had just graduated a 141, which is a professional. It's not the, you know, go learn to fly local, you know, airport school. Um, it was a college style school like Emory Riddle. And mm-hmm. he, he was building hours, right? And that's perfectly fine. That's what he was doing. He was building hours. And, um, but he was very timid. And, um, and so I'm, if people don't know me, I'm six foot eight, you know, close to 300 pounds. Um, you put me in a 172 or a 150, and I just like fill up the whole space. 
and he was probably 5'10", 100 pounds soaking wet. Um, literally had, you know, had to have a booster to <laughs> see himself over the dash. And uh, there was stuff I was knowing, I knew I was doing wrong. And he was just like, great, that's great. <laughs> and, like, and I was yeah. waiting for him to say, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, everybody's different. Cause like some people love just to call, you know, it, you know, and, and so if you're doing something really wrong, you know, they need to intervene. But I, I, I tend to like, and everybody's different. I tend to like the instructors that kind of ask you questions to help you arrive at like what's happening. So like if it's not urgent, but you're clearly like off course, you're doing something wrong. Yeah. They kind of ask questions like, Hey, you know, how are we doing on altitude? Or like, instead of just saying like altitude, altitude, like, I don't <laughs> right. know. It's just, it's just a style. Right runner, right runner, right runner. You don't, you don't have to, I mean, you could say that another way. I don't know. That's just how I operate though. Yeah. I th I, you know, but, but when we're dropping 2000 feet in the third turn of a spin, that's about the time to say, yeah, I mean, not, not as good. Not as good. No, yeah. Bad. <laughs> well, we can, we can ramp up the intensity at that point, but, uh, you know, if, if the situation calls for it. Now, you admit, now everybody, you know, that when, when they're first starting to fly, right, their dream is that first solo, right? Um, and every, you know, most pilots, unless they, 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 they're on some bad drugs, they all remember their first solo, right? Um, and now, so what was your first solo like? Do you remember it? I do. Um, I was my, it was my 16th birthday and, um, Sweet. It, was, it fell on a Sunday, and so my parents drove me to the airport to solo. So I legally drove by myself before I legally – or correction, I legally flew by myself before I legally drove by myself because I got my uh, driver's license the next morning, which was kind of funny. But, yeah, I remember a couple of things. That was 14 years ago now. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I don't really remember being that freaked out. I remember a couple of things that stood out. One, I remember that I, I told the pattern. It was an uncontrolled airport at the time. It, it has since gotten a tower, but then it was non-towered. And I, I told the pattern, I said, hey, this is my first solo for anyone listening. Because I, I figured if there are other Stay people around, <laughs> I knew they were going to give me a ton of space and yeah. stuff. Um, and then I remember when I took off, I remember just like turning around and looking to see like there's really no one here. And it's really all on me. And that wasn't a, um, not in like a, oh, I need to scare myself away. It was more of like a, a rewarding feeling of, hey, I've been training for this for a couple of years. And I'm up here in this little airplane. And there's no one in it but me. And um, I remember that being awesome. And I did a couple, you know, some pattern work. And then I flew a couple miles off the airport and just did some gentle turns and just tried to tried to soak in the fact that, like, I was flying. I'm not on a training mission. There's not someone telling me to turn. Mm -hmm. I'm just up here and I want to go see that house. So I'm going to turn and go over the house. Like, that was just mm -hmm. a, even though it only lasted a few minutes. I mean, that was, that was freedom. That was flight to me. Um, and so it was a real, real short solo kind of went off without a hitch. Very cool. Now, um, now that, that freedom of flight, um, what does that freedom of flight mean to you? I mean, I, you know, all of us, you know, anybody that has flown and isn't scared of it, you know, but, um, the people that typically fly, there is that, that, that switch, right? It's just like, it's like, it's, it's hard to explain to somebody who hasn't flown an airplane. Like, yes, you've like it, people have been in airliners. It's not the same thing. You know, so, you know, it's like the difference between, you know, driving a bus versus, you know, being in a, in a Formula F1 car on your own road with nobody around you doing whatever you want and just, you know, cranking the tires and doing. I mean, so what's that freedom for you like? When, when, when was that switch for you? Was that your solo or, or even before then? Yeah, I think I got some of that on my solo. Um, it, it was probably when I don't think the hours are important, but I remember a moment. It's, I don't mean to plug my channel the whole time, but I, no, I just, just did it, a video on this a couple of days ago that talks about kind of that switch to the freedom of flying. And so it might, might answer that question more at length. But, um, I remember when I first soloed a super cub and, uh, you know, the super cubs kind of unique is, you know, it's tandem seating, it's one from the other and you got these shoulder straps and, and then you've got the stick in the middle. And so you like, you kind of feel like you have a set of wings on. And that's mm -hmm. how I would describe it is that you, the, the freedom of flight, when you're first learning, you're just learning how to mechanically control an airplane that you happen to be you happen to be in, right? And you're learning all the regulations and what's happening and all the instruments and all that stuff. But eventually, there comes a transition. This is what I was talking about in my video, where you go from control knowing how to control an airplane to knowing how to fly, mm -hmm. and those are two very different things. And I think I would categorize that by really being able to feel the energy of the airplane and being able to control and anticipate what's about to happen is how I'd maybe sum it up to be able to say like, yeah, my, you know, my airspeed indicator is important. It's a good reference, but I don't, I don't have to have that to know 
kind of how much energy I've got, you know, underneath me and in the wings and stuff. Um, I can feel, you know, if the, if the airplane is coordinated in a turn, I can feel when it's not, you know, I can feel like the, the, you know, the VSI being a hundred feet, I'm descending a hundred feet a minute. You can start to feel that literally in your butt, mm -hmm. right? Whereas when you first start learning, the only way you know that is because the instrument happens to tell you that. And over time you just learn how to fly. And I think that's kind of what that freedom feels like to me. And that's why, even though I'm never going to fly an F-16 or a 737, I can still have a set of wings on in, in a Super Cub or a 182. It was interesting, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm killing myself for not remembering who this was now, but there was an astronaut. Um, I did not talk to them. I heard this on another video, and they actually talked about this. They, you know, they said, what's it like flying the space shuttle, right? Um, and maybe, this was even, maybe this was from your, your interview. Maybe you can tell me if it was yours. Um, and the individual said, listen, it didn't matter if it was a Cessna 172, if it was, at the time, he was flying F-14s. Um, you know, or, or if it was a space shuttle, whenever he got in and he strapped himself in, he just imagined himself that that vehicle, he was no longer driving a bus. He was strapping the wings on to him personally. Um, yeah. and that was the only way that he could fly. But he said, yeah. even the space shuttle, that's how he felt. He felt like it was just an extension of, of who he was and what he was doing. Yeah, Tom definitely definitely spoke to that. So it, it could be that, or I'm, I'm sure that's common to the other astronauts too. But saying, "Yeah, you really got to strap the vehicle on. You can't just you can't just be a passenger like you're in a bus. I mean, you the vehicle is you. You are the vehicle. And um, I, for some reason, I don't think I don't think instructors and in flight schools talk about that enough because I, I think one that's a really practical side of becoming a better aviator mm -hmm. is being able to you know have a set of wings on. I think you are a better pilot when you view it that way. Uh, but also, I think it's like one of the most rewarding parts of it. I mean, mm -hmm. you don't just know how to fly an airplane. You know how to fly. Right. And not many people in the world's history have been able to say that. And, and we're one of them, which is super cool. Yeah. You know, and also, you know, um, the big, one of the biggest recommendations I always make for student pilots nowadays is they're inundated with glass. They've got four, you know, four up on their, their iPad and you know, they've got another app up on their phone and then they've got, you know, maybe they have a G1000 or something up on the, on, on the dashboard. Um, and you even see them like when they're taxiing or when you see them when they're flying and their heads, it's almost like they're a Microsoft flight simulator, right? Or, or X-Plane. Mm -hmm. And their, their head is down, you know, watching all the gauges. And it's like, just let yourself go. Just get your head out the window and just fly. Like, you know, as long as you, you know, it, it, you'll, if you get too slow, you'll feel it. So... <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, you don't uh, have it's to... tough. I mean, it's a it's a double edged sword that we've got so much information in the cockpit because I, I love numbers and I love mm -hmm. geeking out on stuff. And so if you want to go monitor all your exact CHTs and EGTs and and throughout the flight, which, you know, to a certain extent you should, but mm -hmm. you can geek out over that and start reading articles about I, there's so much to focus on and things to take away. And, you know, I, it, it's hard not to you know keep your head in the cockpit. But from a safety perspective and from a, you know, a fun of flight perspective. Yeah. You gotta, gotta try to keep your head outside the cockpit when you can. Now you've been flying for a little bit. Are you working any, um, any future ratings or anything, anything that you're, that you're working on? Yeah. You know, I, I, I really want to become a CFI at some point. And, um, and one of the things I talk about on the channel again, not, not to plug it, but I just, I, I just try to talk about the things I'm learning there is as I'm, in my own experience, and as I'm hearing from a lot of other people, I think one of the worst things you can do is kind of start something in flying and then just not finish. Because for one, it's very expensive. And for two, you know, two, it's very time consuming. And three, it's discouraging to say, oh, I, I started this and I just wasn't able to finish. And so um, I'm a proponent of saying, hey, go get your next rating or whatever it is you're going to go pursue, mm -hmm. but do it in a time of life where you can be really intentional about it. And that, that can get you in trouble because you can end up just putting it off indefinitely, right? right? But I do think, like, when I got my instrument rating, I waited until I knew I could fly three nights a week, and I got to crank it out really quickly. And I'm really happy I did. And so I, I really want to get my CFI at some point, um, not, like, for the money or for employment or something. I just want to be able to give the freedom of flight back to others. And so for now, I'm kind of doing it on my YouTube channel, and I've got some other other business things I'm wanting to do in, in aviation that I can I can help people with. And so... Um, yeah, I've got a lot on my plate. It's hard to know what to, what to spend time on every day. Well, I think you're going to be a great CFI because you have, you know, um, you have different types of CFIs, you know, and there's the best CFIs are the ones that approach it as an educator. Um, you know, and so watching the videos on your channel, you know, you can tell that you have that, 
that desire to educate, right? You're not pontificating. You're not, you know, saying, Hey, look at me, how great I am. You know, you're doing it as a way to say, Hey, listen, I want to show you how to do something that you didn't know how to do before. Um, and I think that would, I think that style of personality will make a great CFI. So I really hope well, you thanks, Bob. that. I appreciate that. Keep you posted. Yeah, man. Um, I, do you have your, just like curiosity, do you have your commercial yet or you have to do that? So th- this is one of the, one of the reasons I, I I've learned the hard way to not start something and then stop okay. it. So I did, <laughs> No, I don't have my commercial, but I did the written and I did all the uh, the training and then um, didn't get the check ride schedule and then the pandemic hit and yep. all kinds of excuses or reasons that I started and stopped. So I don't have it yet, but I need to go need to go finish that. Yeah, it seems like people jump from the commercial to the CFI pretty quickly. So uh, for some people, they just do the commercial and that's it. Um, but a lot of people that are looking for CFI, it seems like it's almost like commercial slash CFI. It's like they kind of just do it together. Yeah. Um, now, um, for for student pilots that are going out there, going to different flight schools, I have a couple of questions around this um, to get your thoughts on it. So what do you think, and th- these are always the questions that spark the big debates. So um, okay. what do you think is the perfect uh, GA aircraft for the initial pilot training? Oh, good. Let's get controversial. I like you know, it. <laughs> I, I think people, people recommend, you know, based on their own experience, whether they had a good experience or a bad experience, that usually drives the recommendation, right? So I did all my training in a 172 and in a Super Cub. Like I, I didn't do any of the Diamonds or, you know, or even like Pipers. I got, I got my five hours uh, of retract complex time in an arrow. That's the only like low-wing Piper time I have. So, I, you know, I, I guess I would say the 172. I mean, I think, um, I, I think whatever – I'll answer it this way. I think whatever airplane you have access to is the perfect airplane to go train in. Like just go fly. You know, even when I was interviewing Tom, the astronaut, that's what I said. Hey, you've flown everything cool there is to fly. What's your favorite? And he said, the airplane I get to fly next. That's, oh, that's my good. favorite, just getting to fly. And so uh, I hate to dodge the question, but I'd say, gosh, whatever airplane you have access to, go just go get after it. All right. So Charlie's going to be a politician. That's fine. And now I get to check <laughs> off the next, the last question. What we you know, what are you excited to fly next? It's the next plane you're going to fly. All right. Got that now. All right. So, <laughs> um, so now when a lot of people are looking to fly, um, you've done a lot of videos and a lot of discussions on this. So what do you think is better? Do you think it's better to, I wouldn't say go out and buy your airplane before you've ever flown an airplane because you may hate flying. Uh, you may scare the heck out of you. But, um, <laughs> yeah. but uh, after you've flown a little bit, do you think you're better off renting or better off buying? I think it's, I think it's how much you're going to fly. Um, you know, for me, kind of the, the financial break even is around 100 hours a year mm-hmm. if I'm going to fly less. Than, but with the big caveat of you can't put a price on the freedom of owning. Like one of the one of the hard things about renting, regardless of where you rent from, is, you know, availability and how long you're allowed to have it. And like that freedom of flight of like the weather's good. Let's go somewhere this weekend. Like you don't really have that with renting or it's a lot harder, um, which I think takes away a lot. So even though the financial break even for me is, you know, 100 hours a year, like you know, even if I'm flying 30, I don't fly 30 hours a year, but even if I did, I'd probably still own just because that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some downsides. I would have someone else fly the airplane cause you don't want your airplane only flying 30 hours a year. Right. That's for a separate discussion. But, um, yeah, I'd say, so if you're planning on flying a bunch, I, I think owning's awesome. Um, with the caveat of, and this is my story this is kind of where this advice comes from is I would never encourage anyone to buy an airplane if it's going to put them upside down financially. So mm-hmm. a big thing I talk about on the channel is um, encouraging people to live within their means and then spit, which means, you know, spend less than you make. And then with the remaining portion, you know, everyone gets to decide where they put their financial resources and their energy and their effort and their time towards. So decide where you want that to go. And if that can go into flying and you're still living within your means, then that's awesome. And then, you know, you just got to make a decision. Does that mean I have a little leftover to rent or I have more mm-hmm. leftover to buy? So um, that's kind of how I approach it. Yeah, because it's sad when you see somebody, they buy an airplane and they're really proud of that airplane. But like you said, the financially, they just, you know, their eyes were bigger than their wallets, um, you know, and then all of a sudden there's no, there's no money for fuel. <laughs> so, um, and yeah, the airplane you don't, just and you don't want it to be something that you resent, you know, mm-hmm. that like, gosh, it's a, yeah, I, I kind of just swallowed the pill that a long time ago, I, I knew whatever maintenance bill I get on my 182, I'm not going to like dread it. It's just kind of, yeah, that's the cost of flying, right? It's, it's not going to be a, a really horrible thing for me because I waited until I, you know, a time that I could afford it. And that way, you know, when I get the maintenance bill, like it's not fun, but you're just like, hey, it's, you know, it's part of flying. Now, what do you think about, um, I'm going to add on to that. So, so for those, for those folks, uh, you own a 182, correct? Mm-hmm. All right. That's, that's, that's my favorite airplane too, for what matters. 
But um, so so both of us are 182 guys, um, and that's a reasonably, you know, okay, this is an elitist thing to say, right? Because airplanes are expensive, uh, no matter what. And there are some people that would look at 182, and that's you know that would be like buying a 10 million dollar airplane. You know, it's out of their reach. So um, so I get that. Um, you know, but in general aviation perspective, a 182 is fairly inexpensive. Um, it's a fairly accessible airplane for general aviation. Yeah. So, you know, not, not again, general aviation in, in, by itself is very expensive, but, um, so if, if you, have you ever had, have you ever done any, um, co-ownerships of airplanes where you've, you know, you've shared the price of an airplane and, you know, shared the, the ownership of it? Yeah. Well, let me back up for a second. It's funny to, to watch you kind of navigate how to say, Hey, the 182 is affordable. Cause <laughs> I've gotten so much, you know, flack on my channel for saying, you know, Hey, here's an airplane that's inexpensive. Right. But it's like inexpensive and it's inexpensive in the context of aviation. Right. right. Like, I mean, it's still expensive, you know, whatever tens of thousands of dollars are still tens of thousands of dollars. Right. right. So there's no way around that. So it's, it's funny to hear someone else try to try to do that because <laughs> I've had a hard time. Um, people are, you know, People are going to be mad sometimes about that, but um, you know, the, so the 182 is the only airplane I've ever owned, um, and I own it outright. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have some friends that did some co-ownership stuff, and and so obviously there's a, a lot of benefits to doing that financially speaking. You just really, really have to make sure you are well aligned with the person you're owning it because you know money tends to bring out opinions out of everybody, right? So right. as soon as there's a bill that it's like what well, you're going to experience in airplane ownership is that you know your mechanic can help guide you through a lot of this stuff but there's some subjective things that you as the owner have to decide and make a judgment call on like hey this stuff's kind of on the line do we want to replace this do we want to fix this yes or no and it's not really an airworthiness thing today mm -hmm. but it could be one day like that's stuff that you could pretty quickly disagree with your partner on and that could be an issue um i have taken the approach that if I ever get hurt in aviation, it's not going to be because I skimped on maintenance. Right. And so whatever, whatever we got to do, um, preventatively or, you know, reactionary or whatever, um, I'm spending the money on maintenance because that's not going to be the reason I ever get hurt. It's going to be because I did something stupid and I know I can control that <laughs> to a large degree. And so, um, anyways, long answer to a short question, but I, I, I haven't owned with someone else, but that's something I would, would be top priority for me if I did. You know, it's funny on the safety aspect, the maintenance of the airplanes, um, you know, people buy an airplane initially, especially if they, they're not really into aviation all that long yet. They think, oh, okay, I'm going to buy an airplane. It's going to be checked out and then I'm good. And it's like, <laughs> it's like, no, it's like that, that end of year annual and stuff happens. And you know, they, um, I asked the question about the co-ownership. I, uh, I had a buddy of mine who, who had a really good friend was in his wedding. And like you said, sometimes things bring out the bad in everybody. And he, uh, there was a problem on the airplane. And his buddy was a hundred percent sure the problem was caused by him having a hard landing, high G landing, um, you know, causing a problem on, on, on the airplane. And, um, and the guy was like, listen, man, I have, I have, I have just slid this thing in every time I, I have not had a high G landing on this airplane ever. Um, and you know, it was like a $12,000 repair bill. Um, and the one guy was like, I ain't paying it, you know, <laughs> cause it was your fault landing it, you know, and it really caused a problem between them, which was really kind of sad. Um, so you're right. Yeah. You got to make sure that you have those discussions before you buy the airplane. Um, let's see, moving on. Um, so having, the, since, since you have owned a one, a two, uh, a lot of the people that are going to be listening to this are going to be people that might be interested in buying an airplane and you do have some really great videos on this as well. Um, so just kind of in short form, cause they can go to your, watch your videos for the long form. Um, what are some of the tips that you've got for people that are looking to buy an airplane? What should they be looking out for? Well, I think the first thing, and, and to your point, I've got a lot of content on this, but I, I would first start with the mission that you have in mind. So airplanes are a lot like, they're more like houses than they are cars in that they, they serve a particular mission. So, you know, how many people are you flying with? You know, how far do you need to go? How fast do you need to get there? And then you start looking at budget too. And, and it's kind of this iterative process to say, what airplane do I need? Because I think a lot of us start with, well, hey, what, what kind should we get? Like, I think these look cool and those look cool, but like, Gotta kind of put that aside for a second and say like, what what mission do I actually have here? Because um, unless you're just phenomenally wealthy, you're gonna have to buy an airplane that's good at that mission um, and not just good at, at random other things, right? So I think that's the first thing I, I would definitely recommend is is getting good at your mission. And then um, another thing that I didn't really learn until after I got the 182, honestly, was to once you've kind of locked in the airplane that you're thinking or a few that you're thinking. 
Um, you can go research it and most likely you're, you're going to be purchasing used. I think that's probably true for mm-hmm. 95% of people. Um, it is going and doing research on all the different model histories and knowing what the quirks are associated with them. And you can just find that in forums and stuff. I mean, everyone whines about, oh gosh, this model, <laughs> you know, the, the bladders leak or this or that or whatever. So you can start to find like newer doesn't always mean better. Um, like I know the, the 182 I've got, you know, the, the kind of the ni- mid 1970s models are really highly regarded because they don't have many, as many quirks of things that go wrong than say other models. And, and, um, so it's interesting, like newer isn't always better. So find finding what kind of airplane you want based on the mission and then doing a lot of research as to the different models, uh, cause they, they do vary quite a bit. Yeah. You know, it's interesting too. Um, you know, some people, they, they look at the newer airplanes and they just think better, better, better. Um, you know, and it's really interesting because like, again, we'll stick with a 182 like, uh, like you and me, um, you know, yes, they range greatly in price, right? A brand new 182 is what close to 800,000 now, somewhere around there. Um, but it's, a you, lot, yeah. it's a lot of money, but you can get, you know, a 1960s 182 for 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. Um, but you know, you can put a brand new engine in it, put brand new glass avionics in it, put brand new seats, brand new paint job. And you're what you're at 150, 200,000, maybe, uh, which mm-hmm. again, you know, it, in retrospect is super expensive, you know, if, if for a lot of people, but in general aviation, 200,000, you know, that's compared to 800,000 is a fourth of the price. Um, you know, right. you're still getting a, in the airframe, as long as the airframe's good, um, you know, you're still getting a really good airplane. Um, yeah, it's amazing how long they hold their value really. And, and that's one of the frustrating things. Like I've, I've put content out on this, um, cause I, I've, I want people to like learn from the mistakes I've made or learn the processes I went through, the good and the bad, so it can help people. And so part of that, when I talk about, you know, the steps of buying an airplane or whatever, like sometimes that doesn't get nearly as much traction on YouTube as the guy who posts a video that's like, here are airplanes you can buy for 10 grand. They can <laughs> right, always right. view something and dude, don't buy an airplane for 10 grand. Like you don't even know what you're talking about. And that's really frustrating to me because there's so many things that go into it. it, it it's just like, you know, when a, when a beater car drives by you and they're like, oh, they only want 800 bucks for it. And, you know, <laughs> right. a lot of us think, oh, it's only 800 bucks. I could have a car. And you're like, yeah, but I think it's a like time bomb. Yeah. And uh, airplanes are no different. It's just bigger scale, you know. I, I was just recently watching, and, the, and I forgot his name, but he's a super nice guy. Um, I've had a chance to meet him at an air show one time. But um, he was a younger guy, uh, comparative to me anyways. And he um, he made one of those exact videos you're talking about, like the cheapest. I think it was the cheapest uh, cheapest Cessna, you, you know, cheapest 172 or whatever. I think he got it like you said, like six or seven grand or something like that. Mm-hmm. And um, he was all excited, blah blah blah. And somehow it passed the initial pre check, you know, <laughs> purchase thing. But um, but then he uh, he got it home and like it was running rough. And then all of a sudden, like oh, there goes the cylinder. Then they check out that, you know, then like, oh, there goes the whole engine. You know, the guy looked, the guy dug in there and like, oh, you can't, you yeah. really should never fly this airplane again. And he ended up with like $85,000 to even get the airplane back in the air again. So, uh, I believe this... it. It's hard to pull over in the air and uh, have someone look at things, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you talk about safety, you know, it's funny too. Um, I don't know what you drive for a car, but you know, it's funny when people talk about, you know, the money you're spending, you know, a lot of us aren't rich that are in general aviation, but it's, it's, I always find it funny. You'll find the people, you know, that have the hundred thousand, the hundred fifty thousand dollar valued airplanes, right? Which are really expensive for everyday people. And we drive the crummiest vehicles on the road <laughs> because it's not where we're putting our money. You know, it's like, like let's see, I could buy a new car or I could put in new avionics in the airplane. I'm getting the avionics. <laughs> so. That's right. Way more fun to do that. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting. Now, now having the 182 again, you and I, I think agree. I, I love the 182. It's a good all around airplane. Um, you know, I think when people, you talk about the mission, right? And I think you actually have a really good video on this that I watched. Um, you know, that, that when you get your pilot's license, you just have this envisionment that you're going to fly 10 of your buddies on moose <laughs> hunting excursions every weekend and, you know, going on golfing trips, you know, every other weekend and, you know, and then you get into the airplane, you look around and you're the only person in the airplane most of the time. Um, you know, so, so it's, in, it's unfortunate that we don't have a better system in my opinion. We don't have a better system where we can have more availability to rent bigger aircraft when we need them. Um, you know, but most, cause most of the flying we are going to do is going to be with just one or two people. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, you know, the 182, I do believe it carries a little bit more weight than a 172. Like I mentioned before on a personal level, I'm six foot eight. 
Um, I personally just need that space. The inside cockpit's bigger for people that don't know. Um, now, was there, when since you being a 182 pilot, you know, for a while now, is there anything that's caught you off guard with the 182? Oh, good question. I, um, I'm caught off guard by the question about what was what's caught me off guard. Um, <laughs> I, I would say the one thing that I put this in a video um, is how much the insignificant things cost. And maybe this isn't specific to the 182, so I can think of a better answer, but. Like the first thing I did on the airplane was it had these little fairings that were the the struts connected, you know, and and they were like this little kind of cream color, mm-hmm. and that just really bugged me because I wanted them to be white. So the first thing I did is I replaced all those, and it was like eighteen hundred bucks. And oh. I thought, how is a little piece of plastic eighteen hundred dollars? And so that was part of my initiation um, into uh, into owning a one eighty two. But no, I, I think the one eighty two is is one of is one of the only airplanes that like it, it won't do one thing better than any other airplane, mm-hmm. but I think it's one of the very, very few airplanes that will do a little bit of everything. Mm-hmm. You know, it'll do the short stuff. It'll do the long hauls. It'll carry a respectable amount. It's pretty roomy, but it's not huge. Like it's really easy to transition from a 172, um, that kind of thing. So honestly, if anything just surprised me is like, man, it's just a really natural plane to fly. It's a little heavier than 172. Um, you got to get used to that. Mm-hmm. But honestly, I mean, it's a, uh, for it being such a well regarded airplane, like it, it's not hard to go get one. It's not hard to find one. It's not hard to fly one. And Mm so, um, I don't know, I guess that's what I'd say. I personally really like the fact that it actually is a little bit heavier than a 172. Cause like, um, even like when you're landing, like you think, okay, 172 is a training aircraft and 182 is still, you know, kind of in that class as a higher end, uh, high performance training aircraft. But, um, but the one thing I love about it, is that you can, when you're on landing, like in a 172, if you gotta lose altitude quickly, you kinda gotta crab it down, you know, or, or you know, or if you've gotta climb up quick, you know, you're too low, you gotta really gas it up, you know, and really gun it. And the 182, you can really control that descent rate. Um, I mean, if you pull the power on a 182, you can start dropping some altitudes pretty quick. Um, but at the same time, you just leave that little bit of power in, you know, on landing, and that thing is so buttery smooth. Um, because it's not this big airplane. You can really get that. You talk about, you know, when you talked about uh, strapping the wings on, you really can do that with a 182. Um, you know, and it's still got a little bit of power behind it, so you can feel like it can go someplace. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's such a such an efficient wing. Um, it likes to glide. Yeah, if you come in with any power at all, I mean, you're just going to float down the runway, and so that's something to get used to. But it's such a friendly airplane. I mean, for anyone who hasn't flown one, you know, I would almost be comfortable just buying one, even if you've never flown one, but all your mm-hmm. time's in a 172, because it's such a, it's such a close, it's not even a cousin. It's something closer than a cousin. Right. Uh, it just handles really well. Yeah. It's got the kissing cousin. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, yeah, if you can fly a 172, you can fly a 182 with a few hours of practice. You just have to get used sure. to the fact that if you do cut off that power uh, on landing, you know, uh, just be prepared for the nose to come down. But um, yep. other than that, it operates really similar to a 172. It's just got a little bit more, more to it. Now, Charlie, what was the most fun airplane that you've had to fly? Hands down, a Super Cub in Alaska on floats. Um, I only have 5.7 hours in a seaplane, but I got my seaplane rating. And that's by far the the most interesting, most fun 5.7 hours in my logbook. Um, Gosh, I could go on and on about the seaplane rating, but Mm -hmm. that's... um, I, that's the most free I've ever felt. I mean, when you're flying around in, uh, I mean, Alaska certainly, cer- certainly added to that. But when you're flying around in, in landscape that truly is the last frontier and there's, you know, when you when you leave the lake and you, you call flight service and you tell them, hey, this is where we're going and this is when we plan to be back. And if you're not back by then, they come start looking for you. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that would just capture the essence of flying. And so, um and one more thing on that, I think the it could be any airplane, but I, I think a seaplane in particular is just so fun because it 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 I think takes a lot of the um, structure out of flying a little bit. You know, we're so used to just flying to an airport and they have the runway and you go land. It's the same. It's fun, but it's the same thing over and over. With the seaplanes, it's up to you. This is a big part of the rating is trying to figure out. Okay, you got this body of water and this is where you're trying to go and this is the obstacles and this is the wind and this is the terrain where would you put a runway and you get to design it. Mm-hmm. And so a big part of the training is, is, you know, putting up on a whiteboard and they'll, they'll draw, you know, a little lake and they'll say there's rocks over here and there's a hill over here and there's tree line here. Like, what would you do? And so you get to kind of just brainstorm. And so water goes from being uh, an obstacle to an opportunity. It's really mm-hmm. what it comes down to. And that kind of switch 
um, just takes aviation to the next level. So hands down, that's, that's the best airplane I've ever flown. Now, have you ever, do you have an interest in doing that? I mean, so you've loved that so much and that, that story sounds incredible. So have you looked at, you know, possibly doing that in the future? Like you live in Texas, right? I live in Texas, All not right. a good place to own a seaplane, <laughs> um, not, not North Texas anyways. So maybe, you know, I, I think, um, I, I've gone, I've battled this my whole life to try to figure out, do I want to go try to fly professionally somewhere? And for now, like through just a ton of thought and prayer and just being interested in a lot of different things mm -hmm. career wise, I don't think being a, a commercial pilot in some sense is for me, mm -hmm. but you know, having my YouTube channel and some different aviation kind of pursuits and businesses and things, I think I still get to kind of have my little carve out of aviation that I feel like I'm giving back. So for now, I just kind of do things to make money that can go fund the flying. Yeah. You know, I will say that, um, for those folks that have the new Microsoft flight simulator 2020, um, which I was really angry with for the last week and a half, cause it has nonstop crashed on me. Um, and I finally figured it out. So if you have Microsoft flight simulator 2020, it's nonstop crashing, get rid of your custom, uh, liveries. Uh, that's what it was for me. <laughs> so, um, it took me a long time to figure that out. But anyways, one of the, th you know, while it was working and now that it is working, one of the, uh, my favorite things to do in there is actually flying in Alaska. Um, and just like, you know, and, and I'm sure just you're in a flight simulator on a computer game. So it, it has to pale in comparison to being there in real life. But even in the simulator, I'm going, I can't believe I had my wife sitting behind me. I go, can you imagine what this must look like in real life? <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's great. It's no exaggeration. It, it, that um and i'm pumped that the new flight simulator is so good um i think it's all it's bringing aviation to a lot of people mm -hmm. and i think it's fantastic um but yeah it's no exaggeration of flying in alaska that you'll you'll fly you know over some moose and get to see them and then there'll be a bear and then you'll fly down a river and bald eagles will fly over you like it I, it's hard to talk about it because it sounds like i'm just you know painting a fairy tale or something but that's that's quite literally what it's like mm -hmm. um i mean it's it's outstanding so if you're ever going to get your seaplane rating I, I suggest going somewhere picturesque. You can go to, I mean, there's a bunch of places in Florida, which is cool, but they've got places in Idaho and, and Alaska and different things. And so, you know, make a trip out of it. Well, I tell you what, um, maybe this is a collaboration video. We have to talk to our wives. Um, cause you know, one of my dreams, uh, in aviation, cause I'm over on the East coast here and is to fly over, you know, up through the grand Canyon and then up through the Rockies and up to Seattle and along the Canadian, you know, coastline and then through Alaska. Um, yeah. So, you know, listen, North Texas can be on the way. I can, it's I can on come, the way. I'll it's come get you. Why don't you go West? Yeah. <laughs> that would be the most expensive hundred dollar hamburger we've ever had. <laughs> uh, you'll never forget it. <laughs> no, no. Listen, you live once, man. It's not a dress rehearsal. Right. Um, all right. So that being said, you know, money, no option, right? Um, so, so we are no longer, you know, trying to play politically safe about, we know aviation is expensive. Now you're, you know, you're Bill Gates, right? <laughs> so, um, what airplane would you want to own and fly if you, if you just had every dollar available? Yeah, I think, uh, I, well, I own a couple first off. I, I think I'd always have a super cub in my arsenal because mm -hmm. that, that's where you really get your set of wings. But for some reason, uh, well, there's two airplanes to stick out. One would be an L-39 Albatross, mm -hmm. uh, you know, military trainer. They don't make a lick of sense. They're a couple grand an hour to operate. <laughs> like, can't even go far. <laughs> like, don't make any sense. But they look really, really cool. They do look nice. Uh, I think that would be really fun. And then, uh, honestly, a DC-3. I think if I could really? you know, own any historical Warbird or something, even if I could own, like, a P-51 or something, mm -hmm. I think I'd almost take a DC-3 just because... I think those are, you know, for the historical significance of them. And, you know, I just think they've got really pretty lines and they're cool. And, you know, I always thought it'd be fun to, you know, start an old like classic uh, airline company where, you know, they, they run it and dress up like they used to in the, in the thirties and forties, but mm -hmm. I don't think anyone would buy a ticket. So I just have to be <laughs> Probably not. at my money. <laughs> yeah. Well, Hey, listen, if you had all the money in the world, you wouldn't have to worry about the cost of the tickets. That's and... <laughs> true. I could buy my own tickets, you know, fill them up. Yeah. But, if you yeah, said, those, Hey, those free flight people points, would I, come. I kind of lost after a little bit. Now, have you been in a DC three? Have you had a chance to fly in one of those yet? No, not not a not an actual fly. I've flown in a B seventeen and a B twenty five and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, but not not DC three yet. No. Okay, all right. I've had a chance to be in a DC three. Yeah, how yeah, was it? It's fun. It's fun. I will say that I like the B seventeen better. Um, you know, but uh, the the DC three though, it felt like a real aviator's airplane. It just you know the B seventeen was very it's for as big in. I mean, I did not fly a B-17. I want to be very clear to everybody. I'm not trying to say I flew a B-17. I was one of the people paying, you know, $100 at an air show to go sit someplace mm -hmm. in the B-17. Um, 
but I was watching, you know, being a pilot, I was just watching the pilots nonstop. And it seemed like it was real, not temperamental, but it was really peculiar. It had a very yeah. small envelope that it wanted to fly in, um, even without the, even without the bombs. And, um, yeah. and the, the DC three seemed like it was much more, Hey, let's go someplace, you know, mm-hmm. Let, let's get up in the air and let's go. Um, yeah. and, uh, so I think, I think that's a good choice. Um, now, you know, we talked a couple of times about your, um, your channel your channel is called airplane Academy. So, uh, for those that are interested, I'll have a link to it down below. If you're listening to this on podcast, um, cause we recently have started doing these videos and we've been putting the podcast out there. Um, I'll have this in the show notes, but, uh, your channel is called airplane Academy. Um, so why did you start that channel? Well, to be totally honest, I've, I've got a associated blog also named airplaneacademy.com. And when okay. I found out that that URL was available, I had to get it. So that's the first answer. Uh, but honestly, I, I think, you know, I, I don't, I'm not an instructor. I don't view myself as an academy, but I think if you watch the channel, I'm really just giving you kind of the, the honest take of like things I've learned, things I've screwed up. I feel like I try to be pretty honest about that stuff. And just, so to me, it's kind of been an academy in its own sense to say, I'm just documenting my journey, which hopefully for people that are, they're, you know, about to start that journey, then it can be helpful to them. And so um, that's kind of where the academy uh, comes from. Now, um, and I will say it's actually one of the reasons why I like watching you. Um, sometimes you'll see folks and they're, they're airline pilots or, um, you know, the, you can tell that they're, they're giving you a good vlog, but at the same time, you know, you're not hearing everything because if they told you everything, um, you know, they may get in trouble with their airline or something, um, you know, and, and versus you have, you have, you know, there's, you have no boss in aviation. Right. We all the FAA. Um, you I've know, got so my wife. You got your wife. Does your wife watch your videos? Uh, she does. Yeah. I, I, you know, oh, I she, feel sorry for you. She <laughs> reads them and gets mad when people troll me. So it's good. Yeah. Don't, yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't be a jerk out there. Um, so, um, see, the, the only thing problem with me with the trolls, honestly, is I love them. Like, I just get, I just love it. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm like, yeah, let's do this. Like, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and like, I just have so much fun with it. You know, it's like when I get the telemarketer, you know, I'm in IT for yeah. my regular job, you know, and when I get the, you know, hi, I'm from Microsoft support, you know, you have a virus. I'm like, yeah, let's play. <laughs> <laughs> well, the problem is they don't stop. I tried playing in the early days. I'm like, all right, you want to tell me I'm this or that let's, let's ball. And then they just keep coming. I'm like, you know, I'm going to spend all night just going oh, yeah. back and forth. So eventually I said, you know what? It's not doing it. <laughs> just block. It is block. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. Not the, it's not the, the point of this conversation, but it is interesting on the internet, right? Especially for folks, you know, for even professional people, right? You, I mean, you had the people in Star Wars who get bullied, you know? Um, I mean, these are actors making, you know, $100 million, you know? And uh, somebody doesn't like the way they uh, they portrayed the the script, you know? <laughs> they just get attacked and it's like, and they have to like take themselves off the internet. So far, I have not had that. Um you know, I'm small. I'm 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 small enough that uh, I've I've so far have stayed under the radar. Um, and the few people I've had, I've 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 been able to have fun with them. Um, let's see. So one of the well, I guess two last two last questions. So um, number one. So you've I, I've been watching a progression of your content. Um, and by the way, like everything in life, right? Um, you start off at a certain point and you get better. You get better. You get better. You know, it's really interesting with YouTube. I love, I don't know if you do this. I love going back. I love watching the first videos, right? I just, oh man. And, and, and yeah, it's probably a good thing to do. It, it, it brings me physical pain. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, I don't have that many, I haven't been doing this that long. I've only been doing this since April. So for the folks that are listening to this, it's about, I don't know, eight months now. Um, so for me, I'm still in that uh, first hundred horrible videos mode, uh, you know, just trying to get better every time. But even with me, uh, even though I'm still new, I go back to the first couple of videos and I'm like, Oh, how did that happen? Like, what, what, what? um, <laughs> but it's really, but it's really great though. On the same time, when you watch uh, folks like yourself or, um, or even some of the really big YouTubers, as long as they haven't taken their videos down, I, I hate the folks that take their videos down. It's like, no, oh, man, that was who you were when you started. Keep mm-hmm. that stuff up. And then you can just see, and that's almost motivational to see what people did. Um, so first of all, thank you for that. Um, because it is motivational to see, cause your content, your quality, your video editing, your uh, lighting, your lighting especially. Um, and I mentioned it earlier, but your lighting on that uh, astronaut interview was really phenomenal. Um, Thanks. And, um, but it's really great to see that, that, uh, that growth. So where do you see your channel going 
now? Like, you know, where do you want to see it? Like when you go to bed at night, we all have dreams of where we want to take these things. So where do you want to take yours? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I've got a couple things. Um, you know, one, I, I'm, I'm still trying to kind of figure out what my niche is and I'm not trying to be a superstar or celebrity. I'm just trying to help people with aviation and offset some of my flying costs, but I'm trying to kind of figure out where my niche is. It seems to be me just kind of saying what I learned and what I screwed up and people seem to like that. So, uh, for now that I'm trying to kind of double down on that and, mm. you know, you can leave the cool ride along videos to the people flying cooler airplanes than me. And so I think just sharing my journey and trying to think back, gosh, what did I, you know, what have I learned along the way and what would help someone? I really want to try to publish more of that, but there's a couple other things with that. I, I, I uh, um, one question I get a lot about is, is airplane ownership. And so I want to create some more specific resources that help. Like I, aviation is just kind of a dying breed and I don't think it has to be. And I think one of the reasons it is, is because there's not enough information out there and that's changing, but there's not a ton of information on how to go buy an airplane. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to fix that. And then the other thing I'm going to try to fix and use my channel as a way to kind of promote it is that one of the pain points I feel as a pilot, you tell me if, if you share in this and if you don't, it's okay. But, mm -hmm. um, I've always had a hard time finding like cool aviation apparel. It's always mm -hmm. like really corny, nerdy stuff that like I wouldn't want to wear on a date or anything. There's not, but <laughs> right. I wear a lot of like polo or I wear Brooks Brothers, but like I'm never going to play polo in my whole life, but yet I wear polo. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things I am launching, and I've actually got a hat kind of printed up here. I'm, I'm launching a brand called Left Seat, okay. um, which is kind of meant to, you know, be a, a cool cool brand for pilots to wear that represents aviation that, you know, looks good and you can wear it out on date and you don't have to be giving your money to, to uh, polo Ralph Lauren. You mm -hmm. can be wearing something that you actually care about instead of some random brand that, you know, you happen to buy cause you wanted to look sharp. And so some of those things, I'm just trying to think about what are, what are needs that I feel and what needs am I hearing from other pilots in the community and let's go solve those. You know, what I like about the left seat, um, you know, that that's, it's not gaudy. But at the same, it's, I like the title because it, um, it also can spark a conversation with somebody. Like, oh, what is left seat? What do you mean by left seat? Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, like once you know that that's an aviation thing, you can kind of see the flow of the wings coming off of it. That looks really cool. So, so, so when you go to sell those, let me know. Do I, if I buy one, can I get you to sign it for me? <laughs> sure. All right, I'll sweet. sign it somewhere people can't see it so you're not embarrassed. <laughs> that's yeah. fine. Um, being six foot eight, most people can't see the top of my head anyway. So That's so. a good place to sign it. I like that. Um, all right. So last question I got for you, and, um, and, and this may be your Australia one, but or not Australia, um, Alaska one. But, um, you know, where was your favorite hundred dollar burger? What we you know, where was it? Where was the favorite hundred dollar burger that you ever had? So it's actually in Idaho, so not in Alaska. Uh, Idaho, there's a place called Sulphur Creek Ranch, and um, and I I I need to go back and now that I've actually kind of invested in my production and stuff, I want to go back and film more videos. I've got a video or two with my approach in there, um, but Sulphur Creek Ranch is this is this little uh, unpaved strip in Idaho, and the only way in and the only way out is either by horseback or by airplane. Oh, cool. And most commonly it's by airplane. And so they've got a few little cabins there. Uh, they've got hydroelectric uh, energy going off of a stream there. And once a week they fly in with a 206 and drop off the groceries for the, uh, the restaurant there. And so you don't go like order off the menu. You just say, cool. yeah, I want one meal or two meals or whatever. And they bring yeah. you whatever they cook that week because that's what they have. And I've been there twice, and um, I, it's it's kind of the essence of of aviation to me, going to fly somewhere that the only people there are pilots or people who came in off an airplane. It's pretty wild. That is awesome. That is awesome. Yeah, and those are the things that it's hard to explain to people who that aren't into aviation. Like that's just the fun stuff. You know, some of the fun things you can do. Um, all right. Well, Charlie, I think that was pretty much everything I had. Was there anything that you wanted to bring up or let us know about, or anything you wanted to promote about your channel? What do you got? Yeah. Thanks, Bob. I think, yeah, if, if you want to see more, you can go uh, look up Airplane Academy on YouTube. And then uh, 2021, I'm planning on launching Left Seat, which will be available at flyleftseat.com. Okay. Fantastic. All right, Charlie, let me know when you do that, because I'll, uh, I'll buy one of the first hats from you. So. Sounds great, Bob. Thanks for having me on. All right, Charlie, you have a great night. And uh, if I don't talk to you before then, you have a Merry Christmas. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay. And that was Charlie Gassmeyer. Um, really down to earth, you know, good dude. Um, and so I do hope you get a chance to go check out his channel. And again, we'll have that down in the show notes down below. Uh, if you're looking for how to reach out and talk to me, if you have any, um, any guests that you would like to hear, 
go ahead and throw those names and those suggestions down in the uh, the, the, the message box down below. I will say that the, the aviation community has been fantastic. We had just started this show not too long ago. And, um, you know, I literally just send an email to somebody and say, hey, would you, how would you like to be on the show? And I have not had a single person yet who hasn't come back and said, I'd love to. Um, so if you have somebody that uh, you'd like to hear from, go ahead and let me know and I'll reach out to them. Um, and if you'd like to reach out to me, uh, again, my name is Bob Roberts. Um, you can do so on Twitter um, at aerospace underscore live. Um, and then our YouTube channel is kind of where most of our stuff is. Um, if you're not in the, doing the air force thing, um, it's youtube.com slash Robert Roberts, or as I like to say, a name so nice, my parents decided to use it twice. Um, and then on a podcast, um, we've recently have made these so that you can listen to these in your car or on your walks and that's aerospace dash live. So again, if Twitter, it's underscore live and podcast, they don't want you to use the underscore. So you have to use a dash live. Uh, if you are interested in Civil Air Patrol, um, please visit GoCivilAirPatrol.com. With that, I hope you all have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Hey, I hope you've enjoyed that video. If you did, please do me a favor. Hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button if you want to see more content. Up here on the left-hand side, you're going to see another video from our uh, this playlist. And if you click down here, you're going to see another video on our channel. Hope you guys all have a great day. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.